All right, let's bring it to the table. Catherine, um, talk to me about the jury instructions. I mean, we've gone over this so many times about the, the not having a need to be unanimous, but I think people are surprised by that because when you think of a criminal jury, everything you've been told over the years, if you know anything about it, is that the jury does have to be unanimous. How is it that they don't have to agree on the underlying intent here? Well, that's actually not true. So what Yasmin said was for the unlawful means, not unanimous, but for whether or not he caused false entries, they have to find guilt by a, beyond a reasonable doubt. That he did it with intent to the fraud, beyond a reasonable doubt. All 12. Yeah. That he did it with the intent to commit or conceal another crime, beyond a reasonable doubt. That that other crime is New York election law, conspiring to promote an election by unlawful means, all 12, beyond a reasonable doubt. The piece that has been misstated, misconstrued, just lied about is that unlawful means piece. Because the unlawful means could be federal campaign violation, tax law violation, or falsification of other business records. That piece, the jurors, you have five, seven on the others. But everything else, the main charge, and what's offensive, there is someone on another network who is a former judge, yeah. a former DA, yeah. who was a very good DA, by the way, in New York, who is part of this chorus of misinformation. If the judge had said, you do not have to be unanimous about whether or not Donald Trump falsified the business records, the lawyers have been running to the appellate division and filing what's called in New York an Article 78 writ of prohibition because he's abused his discretion. That did not happen, and that's been out there, and it's just false. They have to be unanimous for the main charge, which is falsifying business records. You know, the other thing that's being misconstrued is that the, this jury doesn't have access to the rules because the judge isn't allowing them to have access to the, the jury instructions. They can't bring those instructions back with them. Again, perpetuated by people no who know better. No jury in New York can do that. Explain that. So in New York, in 1987, New York's highest court, which is called the Court of Appeals. It's not called the Supreme Court. That's our trial court. But here in New York, we call our highest court the Court of Appeals. In 1987, the Court of Appeals issued a decision that said jurors are not allowed to take the actual written charge with them into the jury room. Now, whether that makes sense in today's world doesn't matter, because that's what the law is. So anybody who says otherwise is misstating what the law is, and, and frankly, jurors are smart. When they need help, they did exactly what they did yesterday. They rang the bell and they said, Judge, can you give us the instructions again? And they'll do that again and again as long as they need to until they reach a verdict. And we that could hear a bell any moment. I mean, we heard a bell two minutes for air yesterday. Um, they're coming up on they're in eight hours of 14 minutes of deliberation. So they might have another question or they might have a verdict soon. Uh, we'll find out. Um, let me ask you, Duncan, about uh, the, the counts. There are 34 counts, and I've got a, a trusty little uh, graphic of it in front of me. They include invoices, vouchers, and checks. There's a couple checks that weren't signed by Donald Trump. And then there's also the invoices, which were uh, made by Michael Cohen. In, in talking to people and looking over the prosecution's argument, the question that many have is, did the prosecution say they were able to prove the other stuff? Did they prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Donald Trump caused Michael Cohen to create a false invoice. Could that be some of the air or some of the counts that Donald Trump perhaps mm -hmm. is it's more easy to find him not guilty for? Well, that's that's one of the probably weakest areas of the prosecution's case, this notion of whether Donald Trump caused the false filings, even though it's sort of the boring part of the case that no one's focusing in on. And the jury's questions are a lot more about this conspiracy to promote the election by unlawful means because it's the sexier part of the case with hush money payments. But this notion of cause, this word cause, was something that the parties were fighting about with the jury instructions. And the prosecution was asking for a very advanced, uh, a sort of an expansive definition of the word cause that Donald Trump put in motion a set of events such that it was reasonably foreseeable that these business records would be falsified. But they wound up getting a much more narrow um, instruction that's called the accomplice liability that really requires the prosecution, if the jury's paying attention to it, to um, show that he, he, you know, put it, he actually 
caused them to these records to be fi to be filed. So the question is, did is there evidence that's different between the invoices and the checks? It's it's un, it's unclear is is the real answer to the question. Nobody knows, but I do think that the jury could easily come away and say, yeah, there's more evidence that he the invoices are different because um, you know than the checks. But the, what the, at the end of the day, he signed these thirty five thousand dollar checks to Michael Cohen, and that is the circumstantial evidence that he was aware of these false invoices because they were attached on to the checks that he was signing. Yeah, he signed nine out of the eleven checks. Um, all right, the sum and substance, if you will, of today's read back. Other than the jury instructions, they got key testimony uh, from Michael Cohen and from David Pecker. C Catherine, again, this is about the conspiracy. It's about uh, the conversations at Trump Tower, how this alleged scheme came into being. Does it matter that Michael Cohen and David Pecker use some of the, the almost exact same language, we read it at the top, to describe that meeting? It matters because it makes particularly Michael Cohen, more than anyone else, credible. It also corroborates Michael Cohen. Accomplice liability, accomplice in New York State. You cannot just find him, Donald Trump, guilty the on Michael Cohen's testimony. The judge said you cannot just yeah. use Michael Cohen's That's testimony. That's the law There's in New York. Others. And you heard Josh Steinglass during his summation talking about the mountain of evidence, the mountain of corroboration, because he knew that the judge was going to tell the jury that, that there had to be corroboration. It's also important about the readback for the prosecution and they're not going to be cocky and say, this means we're going to win, but I'm sure they're happy. It's their theory of the case that this conspiracy was hatched at the Trump Tower, August 2015. And Donald Trump was not a passive participant. He was the boss, as Michael Cohen refers to him. And the David boss Pecker is going to be mad. David yeah. to a direct conversation was, he had with Donald yeah, Trump. It was Donald Trump who called David Pecker, and David Pecker had to come out of a meeting. It wasn't Pecker calling Trump. It wasn't Cohen calling David Pecker. It was... Donald Trump, the leader, you could say, of this conspiracy. Daniel? Yeah, I, I think if I'm the prosecution, I'm, I'm very pleased with that read back. Because what you want to do in a summation, and Josh Steinglass just did a masterful job of this, is you want to give the jury a road map to follow when they get into that jury room. For all the reasons we're talking about with jury instructions and complicated facts, here's what they've done, just as, as Catherine said. They have framed the case with the first and the last witness about the most important corroboration that we have of Michael Cohen. And the fact that they use similar language, not exactly the same language, but similar, is critical, right? They didn't coordinate their testimony. They're talking about the same meeting, using the same words to describe the same set of facts. Why, in the prosecution's view? Because that's exactly what happened, and that's why you can believe Michael Cohen. And you have Michael Cohen, who has a motive to get Donald Trump. He's aggravated with Donald Trump. He's not happy. But you have David Becker, who really likes Donald Trump and still considers him a friend and has, in the prosecution's words, no reason to lie. 